instead of feeling like, oh my God, I have a disease, I'm a defective person, it's my genes or it's my parents or something like that. Instead of uh, instead, they can understand themselves as saying, oh, I am having panic attacks. It's awful, but it would actually get me away from my threatening danger. And what's happening is a false alarm in that system. It just changes a person's perception, not only of the disease, but of, but of their own state as a person. I'm Adam Hunt, and this is the Evolving Psychiatry Podcast, rethinking mental health through an evolutionary lens. Share it with the people who matter, like it if you like it, Subscribe if you want to hear more. Professor Randolph Nessie is Professor Emeritus in the Department of Psychiatry and Department of Psychology at the University of Michigan. He was the founding director of the Center for Evolution and Medicine at ASU, uh, the initial organizer and second president of the Human Behavior and Evolution Society, uh, and subsequently president of the International Society for Evolution, Medicine and Public Health. He is a distinguished life fellow of the American Psychiatric Association, a fellow of the Association for Psychological Sciences, and an elected fellow of the AAS. Uh, and perhaps most importantly, Randy is recognized as the father of the field of, uh, a father, I should say, but, um, of the field of, of evolutionary medicine and evolutionary psychiatry, um, perhaps the, the preeminent father, uh, and has written extensively on both of these topics. Uh, including many wonderful articles and books, and including the chapter we'll be talking about today. Uh, his most recent book is uh, Good Reasons for Bad Feelings, Insights from the Frontier of Evolutionary Psychiatry, uh, which is a really excellent introduction to the field for anyone who wants to learn a little bit more about evolutionary psychiatry. It's very accessible. So Randy, thank you so much for being here with me today. Thanks uh, for the nice introduction and for plugging the book, huh? Oh, yes. Well, uh, we're also plugging the other book, the, the CEP well, that, volume. That, that's the exciting news. Yes. <laughs> uh, so so the chapter the chapter was called Why Mental Disorders Persist, Evolutionary Foundations for Psychiatry. Uh, I think it's such a fascinating question that people really don't ask that much. And it's something it's exactly the question which got me interested in the field. Um, you know, why is it that natural selection has been occurring for all of these hundreds of thousands of years, and yet it hasn't been able to prevent us from getting sick. Um, so, you know, why, why are any of us susceptible to any sort of these, these, these ailments, these sufferings? Um, so you talk a lot about this in the chapter, and you give a really nice overview of the key reasons as to why mental disorders might persist. So, um, so could you just kind of run through what you think the, the major explanations are Yes, I mean, I mean, this all started, Adam, when I was, you know, trying to answer the phone and get people into our clinic. And there were 10 calls for every patient we could possibly accept. And then I started talking with friends and relatives, and I discovered that mental disorders weren't something that happened just a few people someplace. It was almost all of us. And it really made me start thinking differently. Instead of trying to explain why it happened to one person, trying to explain why all of us were so vulnerable. It's almost like somebody designed us in a way that was malevolent or something like that. <laughs> At the same time, I was had the grateful good fortune to start hanging out with a group of good evolutionary biologists. So in 1984, I wrote my first article about evolutionary psychiatry, even before evolutionary medicine. And my gosh, it really changed how I view the whole field. Um, mm. Before, I just thought people had anxiety disorders and emotional disorders and schizophrenia. But then right. I started asking myself why I had taught, been taught in medical school, yet Natural selection is just not that great, Dr. Nessie. You know, there are mutations and there's genetic drift and there are bottlenecks and, and the like. Mm. And it turns out to be a very important explanation, but there are several others. Um, another really big one is that natural selection is slow. Uh, so when environments change or when pathogens evolve faster than we can, uh, natural selection just can't catch up. And that's a huge issue. Uh, for us and mental disorders, especially with social media and just the, all the food at the grocery stores, you know, we, we right. call uh, obesity and the like as a, an eating disorder, but really we all eat too much because of the environment um, that, that we're in. We could talk about anorexia if you like. Um, and then there's the other deep, deep thing that still I find bothersome and, and disturbing that natural selection did not shape us for health or happiness or longevity. And those individuals who had the most offspring and whose relatives had the most offspring, those genes get passed on and others didn't. I mean, there are people who, like for instance, just aren't much interested in sex. Uh, their genes don't get passed on. Uh, there are people who do things that aren't that nice uh, to reproduce. Their genes do get passed on. As a result, uh, we as a species 
are really vulnerable to a whole suite of mental disorders. And the complicated thing here, Adam, is that it's not just one of these explanations. Most of them apply to most disorders. You've got to put them all together. And that means it's challenging. Right. I mean, psychiatry has challenges in uh, distinguishing mental disorders anyway. You know, there's no strict line between bipolar and schizophrenia or anxiety and depression, although, you know, we're, we're forced to use um, diagnostic manuals to, to separate them. Uh, so, so, yes, you've touched on uh, this, this really interesting and important idea that, you know, suffering um, is not necessarily bad from an evolutionary point of view sometimes. Um, you especially talk about this in the context of anxiety and, and pain and fear, and we can, we can you know, right. think about that. Um, but then there's also this aspect uh, where once you start trying to think through an adaptive, um, an adaptive mindset, then you might uh, mistakenly start attributing adaptation to disorders which clearly um, didn't have any benefit for, for fitness in the past. Yeah, um, I'm so glad you brought that up, Adam, because I mean, our human minds are organized to um, categorize things based on what they're for. A hammer or something that pounds, a chair is for something for sitting. And so it's once we discover that natural selection um, shapes things to serve functions, we immediately assume that everything has some function. And right. so there are dozens of articles out there about you know, what good is schizophrenia and what good is eating or is anorexia and how does ADHD give a selective advantage. And I made that mistake myself a lot at first. And I think one of the big you know, changes that George and I came up with in our original, it's George Williams, my co-author uh, about works about evolution medicine was realizing that disorders do not have evolutionary explanations. They're not shaped by natural selection. On the other hand, traits that make us vulnerable to disease do have evolutionary explanations. And from that, kind of combining that with you know, five or six different possible kinds of explanations and considering them systematically, all kinds of wonderful scientists and clinicians have gotten interested and this field has grown into the lovely book uh, that this chapter will be in. Right, yeah, it's, it's so interesting to, to think about that those adaptive traits and, and how they might eventually lend, uh, lead to, to mental disorders. Um, so, so evolutionary psychiatry, psychiatry is, you know, psychiatry is a practice. We're supposed to be helping people. Um, not that I'm a practicing psychiatrist, but, you know, I, I work around the field. Um, what are your main messages for, for clinicians and for, for patients um, that you think an evolutionary approach can kind of lend us, especially thinking about, you know, maybe negative emotions and vulnerabilities uh, in your experience as a clinician, how have you seen uh, this evolutionary approach kind of change yeah, your, your, your work? You know, I think the biggest thing is recognizing that emotions are symptoms, not disorders. Uh, just like when you go to the doctor with physical pain in your wrist or your knee or your stomach, um, you go to a psychiatrist with anxiety or depression. They're, they're bad feelings for the same reason. Natural selection has made us really want to avoid certain kinds of things like breaking a leg or being the object of ridicule in a social group. Um, mm. The emotions are much more complicated than physical pain, however, um, or cough or vomiting or other kinds of protective responses because the situations that arouse them are complex. So with pain, you know, when there's tissue damage, um, a whole system of nerves and, and like go off. Um, but how did natural selection shape the system that, that assesses whether people in your group are appreciating you or ridiculing you or rejecting you? That is so subtle. It works. We are constantly, all of us monitoring, I mean, how we're doing in terms of what other people are thinking about us. But, you know, it's not a simple process. And I think this is greatly inhibited research in psychiatry because we'd like things to be cut and dried and, and see the spot in the brain or find the gene, right. which hasn't worked. And I'm sorry it hasn't worked, but it hasn't worked. And I think what we're going to have to accept is that natural selection has shaped these mechanisms that regulate emotions. And, and the second thing that's so important especially for clinicians and patients, is to recognize that most often bad feelings like anxiety and depression are useless, but they come from normal mechanisms. Mm. And that's because of the smoke detector principle. I think we can talk about that when we talk about the anxiety chapter. That's because the whole system isn't designed for our benefit. It's designed for the benefit of our genes and because we're living in modern environments. But I think we all, I, mean, I started psychiatry thinking, hey, if this person is having a useless bad feeling, the brain must be abnormal or, or they must right. have had some abnormal experience. 
that's not true. And wrapping this up, because I know we don't have much more time, the impact on patients of discussing that in a straightforward way is just huge. Instead of feeling like, oh my God, I have a disease, I'm a defective person, it's my genes or it's my parents or something like that. Instead of uh, instead, they can understand themselves as saying, oh, I am having panic attacks. It's awful, but it would actually get me away from my threatening danger. And what's happening is a false alarm in that system. It just changes a person's perception, not only of the disease, but of, but of their own state as a person because they don't start feeling themselves as defective anymore. It helps them enormously in cooperating with both medication treatment and behavior therapy. And even psychotherapy is improved dramatically by taking an evolutionary perspective. I'll wrap up by just saying, I don't think there should be such a thing as evolutionary psychiatry as a special method of practice. You know, that's, that's just not a good idea. Um, on the other hand, all psychiatry and all psychiatrists and psychologists and social workers and clinic, nurse clinicians should understand the basics of how natural selection shaped minds and especially emotions, because I think that's so useful uh, for our own practice and our patients. Very well said. Uh, thank you, Professor Nessie, for joining me. And uh, I encourage listeners to um, tune in to the next episode where you'll be talking specifically about anxiety disorders. So the, the book is from Cambridge University Press. Is it called Evolutionary Psychiatry? Yes, Evolutionary Psychiatry um, is the main, main talk. I look forward to getting my copy. Okay, great. Thanks, Randy. See you. Thank you.